Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Mariana Kaplan from NIAMS, and it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce today's speaker to the Walls Lecture. Uh, this particular lecture is the Rolla Eugene Dyer Lecture, and it was established in 1950 in honor of former NIH director Dr. Rolla Dyer, who was well known for his research in infectious diseases. And as such, this particular lectureship features internationally renowned researchers who have made very important contributions to the understanding of the pathogenesis of infectious diseases. And uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce today Dr. Kate Fitzgerald, who is director of the program in innate immunity uh, and Worcester Foundation chair in, my, in biomedical research, as well as professor of medicine at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Um, Dr. Fitzgerald received, uh, is originally from Ireland, and she received both her uh, Bachelor in Science and her PhD in Biochemistry in Ireland, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship in uh, Luke O'Neill's lab at Trinity College. She then came to the U.S. and joined the, of, the, joined the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Massachusetts as a um, Wellcome Trust Fellow, and was then, uh, and then joined the faculty at the same institution and rose through the ranks to, as I mentioned, uh, being now professor of medicine and the director of the program in innate immunity. And uh, Dr. Fitzgerald has really made many very important seminal contributions to our understanding of uh, very crucial uh, innate immune response mechanisms, and in particular, how our bodies distinguish self from non-self. And in, uh, in particular, she has focused on how cells sense nucleic acids coming from pathogens from commensals on from our own cells, and how the location of nucleic acids may be key in allowing the immune system to discriminate against cell from non-self. She also has a variety of other important areas of uh, research interest that uh, she may touch on uh, during her talk, including um, uh, in addition to cytosolic DNA uh, sensors, um, uh, non-coding RNAs uh, that may regulate uh, innate immune function. Uh, Dr. Fitzgerald has published more than 200 papers, uh, making many important contributions in many uh, important fields within immunology. She has received several awards, including the NIH Merit Award, the St. Patrick's Day Medal from the Irish Government and Science Foundation in Ireland, the Milstein Award for Excellence in Interferon and Cytokine Research from the, Inter from, from the International Cytokine and Interferon Society. She's, in fact, the, uh, the elected president uh, of the International Cytokine and Interferon Society. She has also received the Eli Lilly and Company Elanco Research Award from, uh, Award from the American Society of Microbiology and the BD Biosciences Investigator Award from the American Association of Immunologists. So it is uh, really a pleasure. Kate, thank you so much for coming today to give this lecture. And the title of the talk is Sensing from Within, How the Immune System Discriminates Friend from Foe. So good afternoon, everybody. Mariana, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. I'd also like to thank um, Director Collins and, and those at, at NIH who um, gave me this really wonderful honor. I'm, I'm really thrilled to, to give this Rala Dyer uh, lecture. So as Mariana mentioned, um, my area of expertise is the innate immune response. And what I'm going to tell you about today are sort of uh, how we think about how the innate immune system distinguishes self from non-self. Um, so really, the sort of guiding uh, theme of our research in the, in the lab is focused on understanding how does the immune system respond to pathogens and elicit uh, important and dynamic changes that, that help clear pathogens from the body, but at the same time avoid responding to harmless microbes that line the intestine and the skin and, and other tissues. Um, and also avoid responding to self molecules. And in uh, the context of uh, the microbiome and commensal microorganisms, our immune cells or all of our cells are outnumbered at least 10 to 1 by bacteria and, and, and many other organisms um, that provide beneficial responses. So on the one hand, we want to be able to respond to pathogenic organisms, but avoid responding to uh, harmless 
uh, harmless commensals or molecules from within our own cells. And of course, as many of you appreciate, and I'll, I'll touch on this a little later in the lecture, you know, the immune system has evolved to provide protection from infection and to mount robust protective responses to pathogens. But this is really a double-edged sword, and the same mechanisms that elicit protection are, are um, capable of causing tissue damage and destruction. And, and really, our group is focused on um, dissecting and understanding this balance, trying to understand how, on the one hand, we mount protective responses, but how we avoid tissue damage and overactivation of these pathways, and then how we avoid responding, um, for example, to uh, molecules from within our own cells and give rise to a myriad of autoimmune and inflammatory diseases. So failure to mount these appropriately measured protective responses uh, can lead to autoimmunity, uh, arthritis, uh, lupus, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, and, and neurodegeneration. So at the focus of this sort of question of how the immune system maintains balance, we in our lab have really focused on a surveillance cell called the macrophage. And macrophages serve many important functions in the body. They're important uh, for clearance of debris and clearance of apoptotic cells, uh, for example, during development or during the turnover of cells within the body. But they also are equipped with surveillance systems to both detect and discriminate pathogens from commensals, uh, engulf pathogens, destroy them. But in addition, these cells are decorated with what we call pattern recognition receptors. And this is an area where we've uh, done most of our work, sort of defining what are these receptors that recognize microbial products how do they recognize microbes specifically and, and not respond, for example, to commensal microorganisms? And then we've focused a lot of our efforts on understanding how, upon recognition by different receptor systems on macrophages, how they elicit inflammatory responses or cell death responses and the consequences of these responses on host defense. So for the first sort of Start of the talk, I'll talk about some of our kind of foundational work describing some of the core mechanisms used by the innate immune system to sense pathogens. And then uh, I'll move on to talk about some of the scenarios where dysregulation or overactivation or inappropriate activation of some of these same pathways that evolve to protect us uh, lead to inflammatory disease. Um, and then at the very end of the talk, I'm going to touch on regulation of one particular pathway, the type 1 interferon response, and how non-coding RNAs uh, regulate that response. So work over the last 20 years or so has really defined now the pattern recognition receptors that are expressed on macrophages and other cells. We know that these cells are decorated with receptors on the surface receptors within endosomal compartments to capture cargo that enters through the phagolysosomal compartment. And what our lab has focused on, particularly for the last uh, eight years or so, is the receptors that are expressed within the cytosol of macrophages and other immune cells, and in particular, how these receptors recognize nucleic acids. So regardless of the pattern recognition receptor, it can be TLRs, for example, that will recognize LPS or other components that are specific to microbes and not found in our own bodies, or receptors for nucleic acids, and I'll, I'll come to describe those in more detail. Uh, these receptors can get activated, turn on complex signaling pathways, turn on uh, direct antimicrobial effects, regulate antigen presentation, cytokine production, and then instruct uh, naive T cells to become activated and, and differentiate into different T cell effector populations. And really, the macrophage expressing these pattern recognition receptors is sort of, at least in my view, at the center of this sort of system where it needs to early on detect uh, pathogens and then elicit these protective responses. So over the years, we've worked a lot on how macrophages respond to lipopolysaccharide, for example, which is uh, a component of microbes that's specific to bacteria, 
gram-negative bacteria not found in host cells. But it's been uh, sort of made clear or clarified, I would say, over the last decade or more that often microbes are detected by virtue of their nucleic acids. So viruses, viral genomes, RNA genomes, double-stranded RNA generated during viral replication, or DNA genomes can get uh, into cells through viral infection, accumulate, and be perceived by that cell as a foreign signal. During bacterial infection in the phagolysosomal compartment, so if this is a macrophage that has eaten this bacteria, uh, these organisms can be broken down and their genomes exposed or nucleic acids exposed from these organisms. And again, these can gain access to, for example, the cytosol uh, and be recognized. And this is a way cells can perceive the presence of, a, of an intracellular pathogen. And then some pathogens actually secrete nucleic acid like molecules, like uh, cyclic dinucleotides. And again, innate immune cells have evolved mechanisms to recognize these types of molecules and turn on protective responses. So there are more ways than simply recognizing uh, microbe-specific components for these uh, inflammatory responses to be upregulated. So we now appreciate in the field that there are many, many nucleic acid sensors that are specialized in discriminating different types of nucleic acids. These turn on robust protective responses, but the challenge, of course, is that nucleic acids are not unique to a pathogen, like an LPS, for example. Our own cells are filled with nucleic acids, um, and the challenge which, which we focused a lot of our attention on is how do we respond appropriately to pathogens through nucleic acid sensing pathways, but how do we avoid responding to our own nucleic acids and as such mount inappropriate responses? So this sort of slide really summarizes the focus of the lab. We focused on defining receptors for different types of nucleic acids from viral, bacterial, or uh, parasitic pathogens. We've done a lot of work defining receptors, how these receptor-driven pathways are turned on in cells, how they signal through different adapter molecules converging on kinases, to turn on transcriptional programs in macrophages and other cells. So upon recognition of uh, a viral pathogen through, let's say this is double-stranded DNA, if this is a DNA virus, you turn on this really robust, temporally regulated uh, transcriptional program that includes all sorts of immune regulators, cytokines, antimicrobial effectors, chemotactic factors, tissue repair factors, metabolic regulators, and also non-coding RNA species like microRNAs, and, and as I'll touch on at the end of the, the talk, link RNAs, which we think play an important role in controlling the magnitude and duration of these types of transcriptional programs. So there's been a lot of work in the field in terms of how uh, nucleic acids are recognized in innate immune cells. We knew early on that the induction uh, of type 1 interferons was really a hallmark response to a viral infection. This was regulated through a transcription factor called IRF3. Early on, when I first started my own lab around 2003, we identified the kinase, TBK1, as the key driver of this transcriptional program. So TBK1 is a serine threonine kinase that activates IRF3. Around that time, there was great activity in the field, and many new receptors and signaling molecules were defined that all converge on this key signaling uh, kinase pathway. So RIGI and MDA5 are, are receptors for cytosolic RNA. RIGI recognizes RNAs with a 5' triphosphate group. MDA5, a related RNA binding protein, recognizes double-stranded RNA. In the case of DNA, either from uh, retro elements, RNA-DNA hybrids, for example, from retroviral infection, these were shown to be recognized through a pathway uh, that involves this adapter protein called STING, which I'm going to talk about a lot in the talk. Um, STING leads to activation of TBK1, and the RIGI pathway also activates TBK1 through its own adapter protein, MAVS. So all of these systems have unique adapters 
They recognize different nucleic acids, but they converge on this core signaling pathway. In addition, a number of years ago, we identified a second pathway that's unleashed in innate immune cells in response to cytosolic DNA, and that's called the inflammasome pathway. So this is a multi-molecular weight complex that forms in cells that leads to activation of a protease called caspase 1, and caspase 1 is important in controlling not the transcription of IL-1 beta, but rather the maturation of this cytokine. So IL-1 beta is transcribed in cells, but it needs to be processed uh, by this enzyme caspase 1. And in response to DNA, a protein called AIM-2 recognizes DNA and activates this signaling pathway. Uh, a, a really important breakthrough in the field came uh, from work from James Chen and, and colleagues identifying another DNA binding protein called CGAS. CGAS doesn't regulate the same two driven pathway, but it actually recognizes double stranded DNA and takes ATP and GTP and converts it to CGAMP, a novel second messenger that binds to this adapter protein and activates it, and then unleashing this TBK1 driven pathway. And there's also some evidence for DNA damage responses driving this uh, RF3 pathway. So the hallmark response of these nucleic acid sensing pathways is antiviral immunity. So type 1 interferons are a family of cytokines. They're rapidly produced in virus-infected cells. The viruses are recognized through those pathways I just described. And interferons interfere with viral replication. They signal via autocrine and paracrine manners. And really, they work by inducing this army of interferon-stimulated genes uh, shown here. So all of these interferon-stimulated genes attack viral replication at, at different stages of the process. So the induction of type 1 interferons is central to antiviral defense. But like many cytokines, these responses need to be very tightly and carefully regulated. And, and failure to sort of appropriately control these responses um, can be really dangerous, and, and I'll, I'll talk a lot about that in a couple of slides. So as I mentioned, this uh, protein CGAS recognizes pathogen DNA. I'll come back to its ability to recognize self-DNA, but in response to a variety of different pathogens, viral pathogens, bacterial pathogens, um, even parasitic pathogens like plasmodium, for example, work, work in our lab, We've shown that the CGAS pathway activates the type 1 interferon response uh, to protect from, from this myriad of, of microbial assaults. Um, and here's some data just to illustrate that. So these are uh, bone marrow-derived macrophages from wild-type mice, mice that lack CGAS or macrophages that lack sting, the downstream adapter molecule, and in response to DNA viruses like herpes simplex virus, this is an, uh, a Bachmann virus, or an RNA virus, you can see in wild-type cells you meant a robust type 1 interferon response, and this is lost in CGAS or sting knockouts during DNA virus infection, but the RNA virus, Sendai virus, induces interferon normally in the absence of this pathway. Animals lacking CGAS are hypersusceptible in vivo to a DNA virus infection, a herpes simplex virus. And recently, we have generated mice that uh, have a knock-in lacking the catalytic activity of CGAS, so they're unable to generate the second messenger CGAMP. And like a knockout, a cell that is unable to generate CGAMP is unable to drive this type 1 interferon response here to transfected double strand DNA. And these are other cytokine genes. So these responses are very important to, to protect from, from DNA virus and, and bacterial infections. As I mentioned, there's another response to cytosolic DNA, and that's the AIM-2 pathway. It does not lead to transcriptional programs, but it regulates processing of IL-1 beta and this inflammatory form of cell death called pyroptosis. And cells that lack AIM-2 are unable to mount the production of mature IL-1 beta, uh, for example, in response to MCNV infections. So wild-type cells, you get a nice IL-1 beta response, and you lose that in AIM-2 deficient cells. Animals that lack this AIM-2 pathway, uh, CMV replicates at higher levels in these animals. 
and this uh, also results in reduced production of IL-18. So both IL-1 beta and IL-18 production is dependent on this DNA-driven pathway. Um, so it's important to uh, note that these pathways are very important during infection, as I've just shown you. They elicit different responses. But what's particularly sort of special about these systems is they're exquisitely sensitive to small amounts of DNA that gain access to the cytosol of cells. So normally DNA is compartmentalized uh, in the nucleus or in the mitochondria of a healthy, happy growing cell, but under conditions of infection, uh, DNA can accumulate in these intracellular compartments and be readily detected by these different receptor systems. So both AIM2 and CGAS recognize DNA through uh, electrostatic interactions. So they simply recognize the phosphodiester backbone of double-stranded DNA. They don't recognize DNA in a sequence-specific manner. So what that means is that cells where DNA accumulates in the cytosol, where normally that DNA would not be accessible or not present in the cytosol, you can readily activate and mobilize these different pathways. And this is work that, that we did actually with Sam Shao when he was here at NIH, solving the crystal structure of the DNA binding domains of AIM2, just to highlight the ability of these DNA binding proteins to, to recognize DNA in a sequence independent manner. Similarly, CGAS recognizes DNA in a sequence independent manner. So it's merely the presence of DNA in the cytosol that will turn on these pathways. So this raises the obvious question of in, you know, in a healthy individual or in healthy cells, uh, we don't want to respond to nucleic acids. And normally we don't because uh, the, the ligand of these pathways is never present in the cytosol. During infection, as I just showed you, the, the, the ligand can, can gain access to the cytosol to trigger these pathways. But in normal conditions, DNA is segregated away from these sensors in the nucleus or the mitochondria uh, by virtue of loca location. The other critical feature of these systems is there's sort of a built-in waste disposal mechanism where cells are equipped with enzymes, several enzymes that degrade DNA in, in distinct cellular compartments. And, and the role of these enzymes is to limit the accrual or the accumulation of DNA in cytosolic compartments. So there are a number of different enzymes that, that facilitate this. So outside of the cell, there are uh, DNases like DNase 1. There's a second DNase 1 family member called DNase 1L3. And they are designed to uh, eliminate or degrade DNA that uh, accumulates outside of cells. Uh, within the phagolysosomal compartment, there's a, a second DNA called DNA2. And DNA2 plays a role in degrading DNA in that compartment, so within the phagolysosome. So, for example, macrophages that are actively engulfing uh, debris or apoptotic cells in the body, DNA2 normally clears the DNA from within this compartment. Uh, to sort of clear it out of the system so it won't accumulate. And then lastly, there's a third enzyme called DNase 3. It's a, a 3 prime, 5 prime exonuclease that degrades DNA that accumulates from endogenous retroelements in the cytosol. So each compartment of the cell is sort of readily equipped <clears throat> with systems to prevent the accumulation uh, of DNA in order to sort of avoid triggering of all of these receptors I've talked about. So in the last 10 years or so, there's been uh, incredible progress uh, in defining humans, human genetic diseases that are associated with dysregulation of these pathways. Uh, so there are, for example, human patients that have mutations in a, a, this DNA3 enzyme, TREX1, uh, and it's called a cardi Goudier syndrome. I'll, I'll come to, to introduce that disease in the next slide. There's also mutations in the same disease in, in these proteins, SAMHD1 and RNAs H2. And you can see all of these sort of checkpoints uh, prevent 
the accumulation of nucleic acids within the cytosol. So mutations in any of these uh, components of, of this system <coughs> could lead to accumulation of nucleic acids. And you can imagine a scenario where cells from patients that have defects in these systems may start to trigger and engage these pathways. <coughs> Excuse me. And in uh, addition, there's, there's some similar sort of checkpoints on these RNA sensing pathways with mutants linked to the same disease. So human TREX1 mutations have been uh, linked to a disease called a Cardi Goudier syndrome. This is a very severe infantile encephalopathy due to a quasi-permanent secretion of type 1 interferon. Uh, this uh, resembles in many ways a congenitally acquired CMV or rubella infection, but there was really no viral pathogen ever identified that could be responsible for this elevated interferon signature in these patients. And uh, Yannick Crow at the University of Manchester uh, identified these uh, patients and the mutations within the patients that are linked to this disease. Um, there's been some nice progress from Dan Stetson and, and other people in the field that have looked at uh, TREX1 deficient mice and seen features of the human disease in these animals. So TREX1 knockout mice, so animals that would not be able to clear cytosolic DNA, uh, are postnatal uh, lethal. Uh, they live to be about nine weeks and they actually develop an inflammatory myocarditis associated with an elevated type 1 interferon and interferon-stimulated gene signature. So these are sort of features that you would expect uh, during a viral infection, transient induction of interferon and interferon-stimulated genes, but in, in these patients or in these animals, they have a sustained high-level expression of the uh, type 1 interferon response. And you can rescue uh, lethality and, and these features of TREX1-driven inflammation by uh, crossing these animals to CGAS or sting or type 1 interferon receptor deficient animals. So uh, the animals that lack TREX1 succumb to this disease. If you knock out CGAS, this can completely rescue these animals, and that's been shown now for really the, all the components of, of this key signaling pathway. So this is a human disease associated with accumulation of DNA in the cytosol, and then this cytosolic DNA drives this sort of sustained production of type 1 interferons. There are also recently uh, mutations in an enzyme called DNase2, so this is the, the second DNase that clears DNA from the phagolysosomal compartment. Again, work from uh, Yannick Crow's lab identified these human loss of function mutations in DNase2, a multi-system auto-inflammatory syndrome due to uh, biallelic hypomorphic mutations in this DNase enzyme. The patients have severe neonatal anemia, uh, glomerulonephritis, fibrosis, uh, increased anti-DNA antibodies. And like the TREX1 mutant patients, they have sort of this sustained induction of type 1 interferons. So basically almost sort of permanent uh, type 1 interferon elevation uh, that contributes to disease. Uh, several years ago, uh, Shigi Nagata's lab had actually knocked out DNase2 in mice and, and observed um, phenotypes that are similar to what, what has been seen now in these um, patients. So DNase2 knockouts are embryonic lethal. They, they die of lethal anemia. They can be rescued and live mice born if you knock out the interferon receptor. So this is an interferon-driven lethal anemia. However, as these animals age, they develop um, a polyarthritis. So the DNase two IFNAR knockouts are viable, so they're rescued from that lethal anemia, but they still develop with time um, sort of a, a distal polyarthritis. So they have enlarged spleen, they have autoantibody production, they have elevated levels of interleukin-1, TNF-alpha, and IL-6. And you can see in uh, the DNase two IFNAR knockouts here relative to an IFNAR 
knockout uh, control that's sort of sufficient for DNase 2, the swelling of the, the um, feet and, and the hands, um, the ankle joints have synovial inflammation and osteoclast-mediated bone degradation. Uh, we had tried to evaluate the role of the CGAS and the AIM-2 pathway in, in sort of driving this arthritis phenotype. Um, and again, here we knocked out sting on this double knockout background. So animals that lack the sting pathway in addition to interferon um, are completely rescued from this polyarthritis phenotype. And, and the AIM-2 triple knockout has a partial phenotype. You can see that here in the clinical scores. So double knockout animals develop polyarthritis. This is completely rescued by sting deficiency. Um, and AIM-2 plays a partial role. And we think this is because the uh, AIM-2 pathway regulates specifically the IL-1 response while the sting pathway contributes to the transcriptional regulation of IL-1, TNF, and IL-6, the sort of key cytokine drivers of this disease. This is all work that we do in, in collaboration with Anne Rothstein and, and Ellen Gravelisi at UMass. And, and what we went on to show, which, uh, which has all been published now, is that there are sort of multiple in vivo consequences associated with the accrual of DNA in the phagolysosomal compartment. So in mice that lack DNase 2, this DNA accumulates in the phagolysosome, but we think this is not contained within this compartment. We believe that this sort of in, leads to access of this DNA to the cytosol. We still don't fully understand those mechanisms. But once in the cytosol, the DNA can engage the CGAS sting pathway, the AIM-2 pathway, and within the phagolysosomal compartment are the nucleic acid sensing TLRs. And all of these nucleic acid sensing pathways can recognize now this host DNA that's accumulating here and drive these different manifestations. So the sting pathway seems to account for the arthritis. There's also inflammation in the bone marrow. Uh, the AIM-2 pathway and the TLR pathway seem to drive splenomegaly and autoantibody production in these animals. Um, and we also see extra medullary hematopoiesis in, in these systems. So this is really the first example um, of how host DNA, if it accumulates and gains access to the cytosol, can drive these sort of deleterious inflammatory responses in vivo. So in addition to patients that have mutations in the systems that clear out DNA from cells. Recently, it's also become clear that there are mutations that are gain-of-function mutations in humans in these pathways. So I mentioned a cardi goodier syndrome and how mutations in the sort of clearance systems for cytosolic DNA can lead to these interferonopathies. But there are also uh, gain-of-function mutations in MDA5 that lead to constitutive activation of this pathway in the absence of a ligand, and that's called a Singleton-Merton syndrome. And then beautiful work here from Rafaela Goldbach-Mansky at the NIH uh, identified patients that have gain-of-function mutations in the adapter protein STING. So if you remember, STING is an adapter protein that recognizes this second messenger that's generated uh, in cells exposed to DNA. CGAMP binds to sting, and this signaling pathway then activates this TBK1 IRF3 response to turn on type 1 interferons. Uh, so patients that have these gain-of-function mutations uh, in sting like the AGS patients or the DNAs2 patients have a, an elevated type 1 interferon gene signature. Uh, this is associated with uh, lesions on the nose and cheeks, um, scaling, plaques and vasculitis in the skin, uh, vascular inflammation, and interstitial lung disease. Um, so sort of putting all of these different um, sort of type 1 interferon-driven diseases together. Um, these have now been coined the type 1 interferonopathies, and these are monogenic disorders that are associated with an upregulation of type 1 interferon. 
um, that likely is directly relevant to disease pathogenesis. So there are different ways to sort of get these types of interferon apathies. Uh, failure to clear the ligand under normal homeostatic conditions or constitutive gain of function mutations in the pathway itself, like sting. And similarly, dysregulation of RNA metabolism or RNA driven innate immune pathways can also give rise to uh, the sort of sustained production of type 1 interferons. So, in the, in the sting pathway, as I mentioned, sting normally recognizes CGAMP. And CGAMP is generated during infection uh, when CGAS recognizes DNA from a pathogen. So you turn on production of CGAMP and you activate the sting pathway. Uh, these sort of savvy mutations in the sting protein um, lock sting into a constitutively active form. So normally sting adopts a closed conformation when it binds to CGAMP. Um, and that's kind of illustrated here. This is the CGAMP binding domain. Uh, patients that have mutations in sting that, that lead to this interferon response, uh, sting is basically sort of locked into this on position, even without CGAMP bound into this uh, pocket. And I think one of the most intriguing aspects of all of these different diseases, and, and Mariana and I discussed this earlier, is all of these diseases are essentially uh, activation of the same pathway. But yet, in either animal models or in human patients, the target tissues that are involved are, are actually quite different. It's, it's quite remarkable. So in the case of the sting mutations, uh, inflammation in the lung seems to be um, sort of particularly prevalent, and, and the vasculature, there's vasculitis. Whereas in the TREX uh, mutations, here you have DNA driving the pathway. Here you're directly driving the sting pathway. It's actually primarily the neuronal system in, in patients or in, or in the animal model, it's the, it's the heart. So one of the most, uh, I think, interesting aspects of these diseases is the same pathway seems to manifest inflammation in, in different organs and tissues in the body. So we've been interested in, in sort of trying to model these diseases, and in an effort to do that, uh, Mona Matwani, a graduate student in my lab, has recently generated mice where we've knocked in these savvy mutations to try and gain insight into the cell types where sting is expressed and driving these diseases, as well as the sort of downstream consequences. And you know, is, is all this inflammation in vivo, a consequence of type 1 interferon. So the savvy mutations, as I mentioned, um, are generate a version of sting that's constitutively active. There's been a number of different mutations that have been identified. Three of them are shown here. This is just a simple uh, interferon beta reporter assay in HEC-293 cells. So if you transpect the wild-type sting, it drives um, this interferon response. Um, but the savvy mutations are sort of gain of function. They're hyper activating in, in this type of an assay, and all of these are, are really expressed at similar levels. So Mona went on to make the equivalent savvy mutations in the murine sting. And again, now here we're transfecting the wild type murine allele. It drives a little bit of type 1 interferon, but these three savvy mutations hyperactivate this response. So we've actually generated mice now with the uh, two sort of most active. In all of our studies, we think the V154M has sort of a more pronounced phenotype. Uh, so we've generated animals expressing the N153S and the V154M alleles. And similar to what's been observed with TREX1 deficiencies, um, these animals um, are sick, so they, they don't do very well. In fact, uh, we never get homozygous uh, N153S or V150M alleles. Um, the heterozygotes, both for the N allele and the V154M allele, um, sort of succumb within kind of 20 to 30 weeks, um, while the wild types are, you know, are healthy, B6. The mice in general are slightly smaller, so compared to their litter mate controls, the V154M and the M153S. Uh, these mice have an inflammatory signature, so 
If we look at serum cytokines, this is all now the, the V154 amyl, you see much higher levels of type 1 interferon regulated genes like IP10, RANTES, uh, GCSF, other inflammatory mediators are all uh, found at higher levels in the circulation of these animals. Uh, if we look in the spleen, we see a very strong type 1 interferon gene signature measured by nanostring analysis. So wild type animals don't really express um, many of these interferon stimulated genes. Here we've activated the sting pathway with a, a drug called DMXAA. And when we do a DMXAA treatment, we turn on in the spleen a lot of these different immune molecules, so interferon stimulated genes and other inflammatory mediators. And even at resting state, in the absence of any sort of trigger of the sting pathway, we see even a more robust expression of this type 1 interferon gene signature. Like the human patients, the lung seems to be primarily affected in these animals. Um, we see inflammation in the lung by H&E. This is sort of profiling a variety of, of inflammatory um, sort of events in, in the lung, and, and these animals also develop fibrosis, which is, is similar to the, to the human uh, disease. We also see inflammation in the salivary glands, um, particularly in older mice. So at two months of age, the savvy males here have very little inflammation in the salivary gland, but as these animals age, they develop inflammation both in the lung and the salivary gland. Uh, we've also looked in the vasculature, so in, uh, at endothelial gene expression, um, in lung endothelial cells, we see heightened expression of adhesion molecules like VCAM and ICAM. And then we see uh, in a monocyte adhesion assay that savvy uh, alleles, or the lung endothelial cells in these animals, are inflammatory, so, so monocytes adhere uh, to to these endothelial cells. So as I mentioned, the savvy heterozygous mice have increased uh, spleen weights. Or sorry, they're, they're smaller in size, but they have larger spleens, so the V154M, the M153S. Um, they have expanded myeloid cells in the spleen, again, both of these alleles. So the V154M, the M153S. Um, and this is actually primarily neutrophils that are increased in these animals. These are all the flow plots, but you can sort of focus your attention here. So V154M, and here I think we just have small numbers. Um, and this may be partly explained by the increase in, in GCSF levels. Interestingly, these heterozygous mice not only have a dysregulated myeloid compartment, but Throughout the sort of immune uh, composition, these animals are really um, altered. So they lose B cells. So wild type mice, uh, the savvy heterozygotes, here's the litter mate control for the M153S. Whatever B cells are there are activated. So they're expressing class two and CD69. Again, you can see these big differences. Um, and also, they have a loss of T cells, which has also been reported in um, the human savvy patients. So loss of T cells, whatever T cells are there, are again activated, expressing CD44 and uh, CD69. So just to sort of summarize some of the features that I've shown you so far for these animals, these heterozygous savvy mutants display features that are similar to what we see in the human patients. They have a failure to thrive. They have systemic inflammation. They're homozygous lethal. They have an interferon-stimulated gene signature, uh, fibrosis in the lung, and, and at least from our initial analysis, have inflammation in the vasculature. They have increased neutrophils, loss of B cells, loss of T cells. They also have extramedullary hematopoiesis. Um, and we think the loss of B cells and the loss of T cells is occurring very early during the development of these lineages. So the earliest progenitors for both T cells and B cells, um, T cells are decreased in the thymus and B cell progenitors are decreased in the bone marrow. And, and similarly, the myeloid progenitors are decreased. So we don't think this is a failure of these 
immune cells to differentiate and develop its uh, the sort of starting population in uh, the progenitor pools are, are decreased. So we now want to sort of take advantage of these phenotypes in order to try and interrogate both the cell types involved in, in this disease, but also downstream, what are the pathways that are contributing to these diverse, diverse phenotypes in vivo? Um, and in order to sort of do that, we can take advantage of now of, of these mouse models and try and address these um, specific questions. So the most obvious sort of candidate or driver of disease is the type 1 interferon response. And in the other interferonopathies, knock, at least in mice, knocking out the type 1 interferon response has really rescued these disease um, phenotypes. So we want to evaluate these responses. So just to remind you, in the sort of sting pathway during infection, CGAS or AIM2 can recognize DNA that accumulates. The sting type 1 interferon response is really by far the best studied best understood pathway, but the sting and DNA pathway also activates other responses. So inflammatory mediators through NF-kappa B activation, as I mentioned, the DNA pathway can drive IL-1 through the inflammasome. The sting pathway also talks to autophagy as a response and different cell death pathways. So the question is, which of these sort of downstream signaling pathways might account for these various um, immune abnormalities and inflammation in vivo when the sting pathway is constitutively active. And uh, the obvious candidate is type 1 interferon receptor. So we knocked out the interferon receptor on the savvy heterozygous background, and really that made no difference. So this is very different to the TREX1 phenotype where interferon deficiency would have completely rescued the animals that either um, are heterozygous for interferon or, or lack the type 1 interferon receptor are basically identical. So the savvy phenotype is not, at least survival, is not rescued by type 1 interferon receptor deficiency. And we can sort of go through all of those phenotypes, or at least most of them that I've just described, so the expansion of myeloid cells in the savvy mice. So here's the interferon heterozygotes to the interferon knockouts. So really, this is savvy-driven disease, and this is indistinguishable um, in IFNAR null background. The increase in neutrophils is not rescued. The loss of T cells, T cell activation is not rescued. So really, none of these phenotypes seem to be um, type 1 interferon driven, and we're in the process now of uh, evaluating mice where we've targeted some of these other core signaling pathways to try and distinguish and figure out which of these downstream pathways might contribute to uh, disease pathogenesis. So targeting uh, the caspase 1 response, autophagy, uh, apoptotic death, and, and also program necrosis through RIP3 activation. So beyond these sort of genetic diseases, there are also more and more evidence now for engagement of these cytosolic DNA sensing pathways in other types of inflammatory or chronic inflammatory diseases. And just as a couple of examples, recently we were involved in a number of studies looking at how self-DNA um, can be recognized under conditions of stress or inflammation uh, to drive these sort of CGAS sting-driven pathways. So in myocardial infarction, as one example, DNA that's liberated during tissue damage is recognized by the CGAS pathway, and this contributes um, to inflammation in these um, animal models. And in macular degeneration, there's also some evidence that uh, intracellular DNA can be recognized by the CGAS pathway. And then many examples and a really a growing active literature on how mitochondrial DNA can be recognized by these pathways. So in everything from diabetes to heart disease to aging to neurodegeneration to autoimmunity from, from Mariana's work, um, there's the potential for access of mitochondrial DNA, particularly oxidized mitochondrial DNA, 
uh, that may engage and drive some of these pathways and, and contribute to pathogenesis. So just to sort of wrap up uh, this part, so foreign DNA is sensed by cytosolic DNA sensors. Failure to clear this DNA can lead to DNA accrual and induction of C-gas, sting, or AIM2-driven responses. Self-DNA fuels inflammatory responses leading to inflammation and also potentially autoimmunity um, through, through C-gas. And then genetic studies in mice and humans reveal how gain-of-function mutations in these pathways um, can underlie uh, inflammatory diseases like AGS and SAVI. So I think this suggests that therapeutic targeting of this C-gas uh, pathway um, could have clinical benefit. And, and C-gas, if, if you recall, is an enzyme with nucleotidal transferase activity. So it's certainly a, a druggable target, and, and there's lots of activity in this area in the, in the pharmaceutical industry. So just for, for the last couple of minutes, I want to touch on some other work in the lab where we have been interested in uncovering how this type 1 interferon response is regulated uh, in cells. So we know a lot about how you turn on this pathway. And we, in, in, in our lab, have been interested in how long non-coding RNAs can, can regulate immune gene expression. Um, so for those of you who, who may not be familiar with this, so it's, it's become clear now that there uh, are only really about 2% of the genome that encodes proteins. The vast majority of the genome is transcribed as RNA. And we now know that this RNA has important regulatory functions and can regulate gene expression in different biological contexts. There's lots and lots of these um, sorry, link RNAs in the genome, and we really don't understand what, what most of these do. Uh, so link RNAs can regulate protein coding gene expression. They can do that by regulating uh, transcription of protein coding genes, or they can act to regulate translation, splicing, or stability. And they can act in cis on the most proximal gene, or they can act in trans to regulate genes uh, throughout the genome. So in our lab, we have been studying these link RNAs. We've identified lots of link RNAs that are differentially expressed in innate immune cells following infection. And we've been sort of characterizing these transcripts based on their differential expression. We focus on those that are more abundant, those that are localized in the nucleus, because we're interested in link RNAs that might regulate transcription of protein coding genes. And then we use sort of loss and gain of function approaches uh, to try and understand how these link RNAs might be impacting expression of immune genes. Um, and ultimately, the goal is to get to functional targets. I'm just going to skip on a little bit. So we've uh, done this, a lot of work that, that has now been published in the mouse systems, sort of showing that link RNAs can regulate the innate immune response. They can act in sort of feed forward or feed negative feedback loops to control immune gene expression. But we were interested in identifying link RNAs in human uh, immune cells. And we did this by uh, studying dendritic cells, so dendritic cells generated from CD14 positive monocytes. We treated these cells with a variety of different uh, inducers and then measured the transcriptome using RNA sequencing. And when you do this, there are lots and lots of link RNAs that are differentially expressed. And I'm going to tell you a, a very short story about one of these that's um, highly inducible called LUCAT1, and, and, and this is just a couple of slides to sort of wrap this up. So LUCAT1 is a, a link RNA that has been associated with lung cancer. Um, it's expressed in the airway epithelium of cigarette smokers, and, and there's you know, evidence that it can sort of regulate the oxidative stress response, but really nothing known about its role in the immune system. So the LUCAT1 locus is activated in dendritic cells. So if we look here at this locus after uh, LPS stimulation, so 0, 30 minutes, you know, increasing LPS doses. Here is ATAC sequencing, H3K4 trimethylation, H3, um, K27 acetylation. So this link RNA is upregulated. It's associated with um, open and accessible chromatin. 
and by RNA sequencing, it's rapidly upregulated in, in immune cells. After LPS stimulation, it's highly inducible, and it's inhibited by a JAK inhibitor. So this seems to be an interferon-stimulated gene, and we were interested in understanding if uh, this link RNA, like, like other link RNAs, might perhaps regulate the uh, interferon program or interferon-stimulated gene expression. So we uh, use this approach called nanoblades, which has enabled us to target link RNAs in um, primary cells so we can knock out LUCAT1. This is actually in, sorry, in THP1 cells, but we've done similar experiments in dendritic cells. When you knock out LUCAT1 expression, you get hyperactivation of the interferon response. This is the interferon gene signature. So compared to a response you would see in, in wild type um, cells, so you have very little expression of the interferon gene signature. But in these three clones that lack LUCAT1, you now start to turn on at very high levels the type 1 interferon gene signature. And we can do the inverse experiment where we take advantage of the Cas9 system to uh, target a dead Cas, or sorry, a, an active Cas9, so to activate LUCAT1 expression from its endogenous locus. And if we guide this uh, active Cas9 to the LUCAT1 locus, we can turn on expression of LUCAT1 in cells. And now if we stimulate these cells with sendivirus or with LPS, they're unable to turn on the type 1 interferon response. So by both loss and gain of function approaches, LUCAT1 uh, seems to negatively regulate the type 1 interferon response. So link RNAs can be either in the cytosol or the nucleus. Uh, LUCAT1 is primarily nuclear localized. Um, so this is just by fractionation. This is by single molecule RNA fish, and I'll show you these images in a moment. But after LPS stimulation, the induced uh, LUCAT1 is restricted to the nucleus. And you can see that here using single molecule RNA fish. So here's nuclear staining. Here's LUCAT1 expressed uh, within the nucleus uh, of resting cells. And after LPS stimulation, you see a large increase in this sort of nuclear uh, pool of, of LUCAT1. So we think that this is a link RNA that's induced when these innate immune sensing pathways are activated. Turning on, as I talked about in the start of this lecture, the type 1 interferon response, and then interferon signals back on its own receptor to upregulate the interferon-stimulated gene signature. And this includes LUCAT1. So we think LUCAT1 is an interferon-stimulated gene but then this link RNA functions to shut off this response. So we think this is part of a sort of post-induction feedback mechanism to control or shut, shut off again the, the type 1 interferon gene signature. And we're taking advantage of, of different approaches to try and understand where exactly LUCAT1 is localized throughout the genome. Um, to facilitate the sort of regulation of this type 1 interferon response. So LUCAT1, like, like many link RNAs, has been shown to bind to the polycomb repressor complex. Um, we validated these findings uh, also in, in dendritic cells, and we think that LUCAT1 is shutting down this type 1 interferon gene signature um, through binding to PRC2, and PRC2 is a complex that um, methylates H3K27, um, and this leads to transcriptionally silent chromatin. So we think this is an example um, of one sort of layer of regulation to, to control these type 1 interferon responses. And from what I showed you in the early parts of this talk, the type 1 interferon response is, is a critical driver of host defense. Um, but failure to sort of control this response appropriately can, can lead to human disease, and, and we think by sort of dissecting um, the tight regulation of type 1 interferons, we can perhaps come up with new approaches to, to control these responses. So I'm going to end there. Um, I want to acknowledge the people who really contributed to all the work I showed today, 
So some of the folks here at the, the bottom really were involved in our early work on uh, nucleic acid sensors and their role in, in the host response to infection. Uh, Mona has done all of that work I described on the, the savvy mice. Um, Shuli has done all of the work on LUCAT1. And I want to thank Anne, Ellen, and our many really great collaborators, and of course, NIH for funding. And, and um, the Savvy Project is also funded by the Lupus Research Alliance, and we got some key reagents from Biogen. And I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> John. That's great, Kate. So I was thinking about your result with the savvy mice and, and then deleting the interferon receptor yeah. and comparing and contrasting that with Raffaella's work on JAK inhibitors yeah. in patients. And so might you imagine that there are cytokines that are induced other than type 1 interference, that that's what IRF3 is doing, or is that how you think about it? Yeah, so actually I, I didn't go through all of that data. So we've also knocked out IRF3, um, and that also does not rescue survival. So, so we think, so it, certainly the signature response in these type 1 interferonopathies is elevated interferon. but. That's the focus of what everybody talks about. But the sting pathway drives NF-kappa B. There, you know, if you activate sting, there's thousands of genes that are very robustly upregulated. Um, we actually have some evidence that we think it's a, it's a cell death pathway that's involved in these responses. Um, but we're, we're still trying to dissect that with the genetic approach. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I think there may be features of inflammation that are because of the interferon response. but there's other, other things here, and I think that's why this is a nice model to dissect some of these other pathways. Hi. Hi. So I was interested in the SAVI model. Have you looked at, you said there was increasing neutrophils. Have you looked at their ability to form nets? And no, we, no we, we have not. We plan to, but, yep. Well, you mentioned quite a few parameters of sensors. So yeah. what is it unique and uh, about this sensor for single-stranded RNA or double-stranded DNA? Because it has to be specific and it has to interact quickly. And what happens when, like a TB bacterium stays inside? And what happens in the chronic phase about this phase of detection and activation and further response? So, so in terms of these sensors, um, at least talking, you know, specifically about the DNA sensors, it's really all about location of nucleic acids. So there's nothing special about the ability of these receptors to distinguish DNA from a bacteria versus a host cell. It'll res these receptors will respond to any DNA that, that gets into the cytosol. So pathogens that, you know, replicate in the cytosol are those that perhaps, um, you know, get degraded or so, so somehow the immune system is liberating nucleic acids to be sensed by these pathways. All right. so I guess and and our, sorry, for, for the RNA pathways, there, there is more specificity. So rig I will recognize um, features of viral RNAs that, so the five prime triphosphate end, um, and you don't see that in host RNAs that are in the cytosol. So that's, that's a specific recognition. So what happens in the resident macrophage when you have a TB mycobacterium because they are living for a long time? Um, so, you know, I think there's not recognition, right? The, these sensors don't get access to the nucleic acids within within that bacteria. So at least that's my understanding. We, we haven't looked at TB directly, but. All right, good luck. <laughs> uh, yeah. you, you mentioned a number of different diseases, and, and you alluded to autoimmune diseases. And one of the slides showed um, antibodies to nuclear antigens. And I'm wondering um, about the, the implications of research in terms of lupus. Maybe it's a whole hour response, but. What yeah, so we, we've also actually done a lot of work in that area. So we've, we've not, so the CGAS sting pathway, we've evaluated the role of 
that pathway in sort of a more complex systemic autoimmune disease. So SAVI is, you know, a sort of a simpler case where clearly it's that pathway that's activated. So in, for example, the MRL-LPR model of autoimmunity, if we target these pathways, we don't see any decrease in disease pathogenesis. In fact, we see slightly increased susceptibility, faster development of ANAs. So I th we, ha we just haven't done the work and certainly in enough of the mouse models to say that this pathway doesn't contribute. I think there's a lot of evidence that would suggest it probably does in different ways. Yep. Uh, since we lose tissues such as our embryonic tails uh, during maturation, one, one would guess that there must be some interesting and careful regulation of these functions in the course of development. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a really interesting question. Or, you know, during cell division, I mean, there's many scenarios where you can imagine DNA should become accessible to these cytosolic sensors. So, you know, there, there's got to be very tight regulation to prevent that, and, and we don't really understand that. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And a quick announcement, there is going to be a reception at the NIH library for the Walls Lecture, and everyone is welcome to join. Thank you again.